this is a wonderful book. Uh, I uh, highly recommend uh, anyone interested in American history, in uh, right-wing movements, in social movements, uh, in feminism, uh, buy it. Uh, of course, it's for sale. Uh, one of the things that makes it, I think, an outstanding purchase is not merely the words, but that Linda has uh, clearly done some uh, yeoman uh, photo research, and uh, the pictures are spectacular. Um, you can see on the cover, uh, you have, uh, if any of you have it, um, Klansmen marching arm in arm down Pennsylvania Avenue. How many people, that was a very big rally, probably thousands and thousands. Well, you don't know because the Klan exaggerated right. everything all the time. <laughs> uh, lots of people. Uh, there's an, a, a stunning image of um, a kind of a county fair Ferris wheel. Uh, in which every uh, body on the, every seat is a hooded Klansman. Uh, there's an image we'll talk about later about, uh, of about 30 or 40 Klansmen uh, at a church altar underneath a sign that says, uh, Jesus saves, uh, which kind of brings uh, up how I want to kind of introduce the subject of the book, which is the second Ku Klux Klan. Uh, Linda calls it the second coming of the Ku Klux Klan. The first Ku Klux Klan was nicknamed the Invisible Empire. Uh, their most famous representation in uh, popular culture was, of course, in Gone with the Wind, in which uh, they were referred to as a political organization. Very much furtive, underground, they were night riders, uh, no one knew who they were. If you saw a Klansman, you knew to shudder and run. That's not this Klan. So maybe we can talk about uh, the relationship of the first clan and the second clan and uh, how they differ and how they evolved and why one was furtive and one almost fetishized visibility. Sure, I'm happy to do that. But before I answer, I just want to say, first of all, I've been in my life of research in many historical societies and this one is by far the most lively. And second, I, I just want to apologize for being late. This is way, you know, I, I'm not a New Yorker, and so I get lost. Um, the second clan actually uh, claimed to be continuing the first clan. But it was different in a series of major ways. First of all, it was not secret. Second of all, it was a mass movement having somewhere between three and five million members. Uh, third, it had women. Fourth, it um, was uh, in the main non-violent. And fifth, its, base, its basic strategy was electoral, and I can talk about that later. And mm -hmm. finally, the, perhaps the most important thing is it expanded what you might call the hate list. The first clan was entirely focused on uh, keeping African Americans down and used lynching to not only punish individuals but to intimidate the whole population. The second clan, understanding its founders understanding that you wouldn't get a lot of traction by concentrating only on African Americans because in 1920, very few African Americans lived in the northern states. They expanded their list to add Catholics and Jews and immigrants, but immigrants is really the same category because in the waves of immigration that had grown larger from about 1880, very few of those immigrants were Protestant. Uh, and when they said Catholics also, they included the Russian and Greek Orthodox. My impression is they didn't exactly register that they were different, but it uh, was uh, equal opportunity uh, bias. Right. Uh, I would add one more thing. I don't know if you would characterize this quite this way organizationally, but uh, this clan was also, um, you might call it a for-profit business. It was extremely entrepreneurial, so this is one of the reasons. You tell the story of this one guy who kind of came up with the idea of creating a second Ku Klux Klan, and he kind of failed, and he kind of, well, he kind of brought in these public relations agents who used the most modern, sophisticated marketing techniques, which included broadening the market, you know, uh, uh, for, 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 for who you should be hating. And 
It was basically, I, I wrote a book, uh, an article for The Baffler a few years ago called The Long Con, and it was about how much of right-wing politics has kind of devolved into a money hustle. You know, people, even before the internet, were getting kind of uh, terrifying hair-on-fire letters from Richard Viguerie saying, you know, uh, the left wants to teach your children cannibalism and sex ed and teach them how to have sex and send, send me 10 bucks so we can, you know, save the world. We all know how it works now with the internet. It wasn't necessarily all that different for the Klan, in which did sort of function like, in a sense, like a pyramid scheme. It was a pyramid scheme. Um, it, a recruiter could keep 40% of the initiation fee. Now, the initiation fee was $10 in 1920, but that is worth over $100 today. It was not cheap. And this is one, this underlies one important fact that, and that is that very low income people were not in the Klan. Uh, so, you, you know, if I recruited you, I can keep 40%, but you can then turn around and recruit somebody else and keep 40%. And this can keep going until there's just no one left to recruit. And that's what is the problem with pyramid schemes. But ultimately, well, this problem was, for some people. Well, right. <laughs> Come on. Ultimately, this was the undoing of the Klan because there was so much money flowing, and I can give examples later if you want, that the corruption became too, too much to ignore. And a lot of Klan members became very disillusioned and a little embittered about, uh, about what was going on. And also, it's not just initiation fee. Let me just mention two other forms of income. They, they made a, a uniform in such a way as to make it very, very difficult for a woman to take old sheets and sew it herself. And they did this knowingly in order to make people have to pay for it. But second, people in the Klan started manufacturing all sorts of tchotchkes and memorabilia. You could get a Klan pocket knife and you could get a, a Klan brooch for your wife. And, and they were just marketing these things publicly in all, all these newspapers and all this money completely unaccountable was flowing right. in. You know, you too can wear a $20 red, you know, Make America Great cap, you know, that's mm -hmm. jump on TV. Um, so, they were so entrepreneurial. You have a passage on page 147. Clannish nativism was ever flexible. You know, they're kind of always kind of uh, broadening the ken of people that they want to attract, uh, as was its ability to respond to local conditions. In Oregon, clan efforts were almost exclusively anti-Catholic, meaning mentioning Jews only occasionally. In the San Diego region, region some Catholics even joined. Uh, members of the Catholic War veterans and Knights of Columbus uh, were known to be Klansmen. Even though elsewhere we learned that clan, the clan believed that uh, uh, there were gonna uh, the, the hundred bishops in America were gonna be um, hundred dictators for a hundred states, and uh, and that the, the the nuns were kept as sex slaves by the priests that didn't keep these folks from Sa in San Diego from getting that membership money. Uh, and just as the clan bent its agenda to fit local conditions, so did the Catholic Church. Uh, in Southern California, many white Catholics uh, supported the clan. So. There's all this diversity, but obviously there's an underlying. Um, you 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 don't characterize it as an ideology. This gets into kind of a technical sociological debate about how you kind of characterize what people think and feel and how that joins them together in movements. But you you say it's better to describe a clan structure of feeling. So what was that structure of feeling? Uh, what structured it? What made you a clansman? What did clansmen believe? Um, let me think about how to respond to this for a moment. Um, first of all, clan speakers, there were a, a whole hundreds of professional lecturers who went all over the country. Uh, they earned money by doing this. You know, these are the days before television when, when a lot of people actually paid to go to lectures. Um, their, their job was, in a way, to rev up anger but the anger rested on fear. And that's a really important thing to register. Um, maybe later I'll say more specifically some of the fears. And, and I know that there will be hard for you to believe that people believed in them. But the idea was that America was destined by God to be a nation of white 
sort of Anglo-Saxon Protestants, and there were people who were trying to erode that destiny to subvert the true cause of this country. Um, let me give you now just one example of that um, uh, cr creation of fear through outrageous claims. Uh, a common claim was that all of these immigrants who had come from Southern Europe, Eastern Europe, et cetera, they didn't come because they were poor. They didn't come because they were persecuted. They came because the Pope ordered them to. He ordered them to come to this country where they would function like moles in a spy story. They would go underground, so to speak, and remain incognito until the Pope gave the sign for the coup that was going to take over the American government. So, you know, I, I think when I call it a structure of feeling, which is not my own phrase, it comes from a, a really, really interesting uh, British critic, but what I want to say is that emotion can be constructed just like knowledge can. And one of the things that we see is you can get, you can get this intense anti-Catholicism in places where there are hardly any Catholics. Uh, intense anti-Semitism where among people who had probably never seen a Jew. Uh, it's, it's quite obviously uh, relevant to some stuff that we're seeing today. Right, right. And um, you argue, um, well, let's, let, let, let me back up. So let's also establish the broader political, cultural context of the United States coming out of World War I. It's not like the Klan were the only racist bigots out there. It was a profoundly, I mean, especially profoundly racist time in the 1920s. So maybe we should establish uh, some of the mainstream kind of elite uh, bigotry that kind of structured things. Yeah, you know, I think it's quite possible that the majority of American white Protestants agreed with the Klan's basic uh, ideology. They may not all have accepted these wild stories about what the Pope was doing. You have to remember that these are the days in which, for example, the great universities had quotas for Jews. I can tell you that my college, as late as the 1960s, had such a quota. And if you're interested later, I can tell you how I slipped in. But um, you also had professors in these great universities who were uh, Propose, propounding and writing uh, scholarly tomes right. about eugenics, and eugenics, which is technically the science of human, human breeding, but what it was about was a whole hierarchical ladder in which all the peoples of the world are uh, placed on several rungs from the superior ones to the most inferior ones. Um, now, I'm, this, I'm not sure that I, I want you to be clear that these views were not unchallenged, but they were very, very common. Then another thing that happened r right after the World War War, World War One, was uh, a, a kind of hysterical fear uh, about uh, communists. And actually, this started well before the Russian Revolution. Uh, but you had what became known to historians as the Palmer Rage. You may have heard of this, in which uh, several hundred, I think closer to a thousand people were deported because they were charged with sedition. And so you, that was, that was not particularly racialized, but you certainly had this feeling being promoted that there were these people in the United States who wished evil things for the United States and that it was important to take very strong action against them. Right. And I mean, if you read, just to get a sense of how um, pervasive it was, even across the, the political spectrum. I mean, if you read the Supreme Court's uh, Bell case, which is the famous case in which Oliver Wendell Holmes, who was a famous progressive, and wrote the opinion, uh, three generations of imbeciles are enough, uh, it was um, about, well, if it's okay for the state to protect the, uh, for, for the state to protect the nation by conscripting people into combat for which they would die, it's okay for the state, or it's actually a, a blessing, it's necessary for the state to uh, protect the nation uh, by preventing uh, imbeciles from breeding. And of course, 
if you actually study the facts of the case, it turns out that the woman who was sterilized was not a quote unquote imbecile. Uh, her 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 uh, her uh, little daughter was actually quite intelligent. It's quite a fascinating case, but it just shows that it wasn't like the Klan over here and mainstream America over there. Uh, but you argue that this Klan was not um, necessarily a violent organization. I mean, there's lots of violence in the book. Strikingly, a lot of it is in the South, uh, so that kind of goes back and has its own roots. Um, but you almost kind of end up arguing that you know, it didn't have to be because it got what it wanted through the political process. Uh, talk about uh, how um, politically successful the Ku Klux Klan was in electoral politics, how that worked, and what they accomplished. Yeah, um, I, it is important that they were not 100% nonviolent. In fact, the leaders walked a very delicate, slippery line about this because their big public statements were this is an absolutely law-abiding nonviolent organization. Well, they were the, well, seven, there's the, the head, well, I'll let you, I'll let you lecture. Well, that's right. <laughs> but they also knew that they could attract people, particularly young men, with the promise of being able to participate in vigilantism. Uh, and so it, there's, in fact, at some points, they're absolutely directly dishonest about this. But it was, they were absolutely right to follow this electoral strategy because they won so much. Uh, just a, a few figures, they elected 11 governors, 45 members of Congress, thousands of state, county, and municipal work, uh, officers. And I, I want you to understand, these are not covert Klansmen. These are uh, publicly Klan's people. Um, however, there were two really massive victories at the national level. The first one actually happened right here in New York in 1924 at the Democratic Convention, which was held in Madison Square Garden. The, the leading candidate going into the convention was the governor of New York, Al Smith. But Al Smith is a Catholic. Uh, this, this is the longest political convention on record. It went through 103 ballots. And, but it became known as the Klan Bake because the supporters of the Klan basically vetoed the nomination of Al Smith. And then the Democratic Party lost the election. I'm not saying that Al Smith could have won, but certainly a relationship. But only Oh, and, and there's one just little vivid thing about that convention I want to just tell you. The Klan had quite a lot of strength in New Jersey, and during the convention, on several nights, they put up a cross. They claimed it was 50 feet high on the shores of the Hudson on the New Jersey side so that it could be seen if you walked from Madison Square Garden to the river. Uh, and incidentally, they... It, theoretically, these are burning crosses, but after a while, they started to mainly use light bulbs. They're very modern. In, they're in really technology. But the, the I think, far more important thing that happened was the uh, Immigration Restriction Act of 1924. That act, some of you may not be familiar with it, but it set quotas for different groups of people who could be allowed to come. Big quotas for white, Nordic, Anglo-Saxon, et cetera, very, very small quotas for. In other words, this law enacted exactly the Klan's hierarchy of the races. And uh, I want to point out something else that is just really important to keep in mind. That law was the law of immigration until 1965. Yes. 40 years uh, of that. Uh, One of our native sons here, Mr. Emanuel Seller of Brooklyn, kind of defined his career uh, mm. from that window, really. He, he fought against it in 1924, and he repealed oh, it in 1965. That. Yes, yeah. indeed. Yeah. Um, so, and then we have, um, you know, a state like Indiana, where the, 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 the head of the Klan there said, I am the law. 
Uh, it was an enormous political machine. And then what you told me is your, your home state in Oregon, where it was kind of the seedbed. There's a whole chapter on Oregon, which was a stupendously racist state, would shock a lot of us. Um, uh, a very uh, interesting campaign against um, something that we usually think of now as uh, something that the right kind of likes, which is private schools. What was their beef with private schools? And how did that play out? Yeah, well, the, the one piece of legislation at state level that they introduced everywhere they possibly could was to ban private schools. But what they really meant was to ban Catholic schools. Uh, but this is a kind of interesting, it, it kind of twists things around because, bef because they wanted to get rid of these religious schools, they did become supporters of uh, more tax money going to education. They even proposed at one point that there should be a federal department of education. Although, on the other hand, they were very staunch about teaching the Bible in, in these schools, but of course it was the Protestant Bible. So their claims to be wanting to separate church and state were completely phony. Um, Oregon is the only state that passed this ban on public schools, and it passed it as an amendment to the state constitution. Um, and this is a place where, I, I don't remember the figures, though they're in the book, but I know that the number of both Catholics and Jews was under 1%. We're talking about a fraction of, of 1%. Um, this law was overturned. Uh, by the courts, but it just is a, is a sign of this strength. Uh, in fact, it probably won in Oregon because there were not enough Catholics to mount a really organized opposition, which there would have been when they introduced it, say, in New Jersey or uh, Maine or other places. Yeah, um, and uh, this is a case where uh, the role of Democrat, Democratic, small R Republican institutions are, you know, so important in rolling over the depredations of right wing demagoguery. The Supreme Court said, you know, no way. You know, this this is not this is unconstitutional. So they tried to get around it in various ways, but the the impetus was there. Although, you know, the courts that ruled against the ban on Catholic schools did not r rule that way on, on the, any grounds of religious freedom. Uh, those of you who are lawyers may understand this. They overturned it on the grounds that it was a taking of property, that uh, the Catholic schools were owned, and therefore it was unconstitutional simply to take their property away from them. Wow, that, that is a very right-wing doctrine, actually. Interesting. Uh, so you talk about uh, historically that the, within kind of the, the long durée of American history, the, the, the second clan has uh, six ancestors, each of them long embedded in American history. You, you cite racism, nativism, temperance, fraternalism, populism. I, I might add entrepreneurialism. Uh, uh, but the, I'm saving the, the best for last, uh, and that's Christian evangelism. You call it, uh, the, the book is The Second Coming of the KKK. So it almost has like a Christian reference in the title. Very, very clever, Professor. Do you want to do a little <laughs> reading for me? Sure. Uh, I, I, I love this one on 1989. The, 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 when Recruiters Came? Yes. I hope that's a favorite sure. of yours, too. When recruiters came into a new region, they went first to Masons, but to ministers next, promising to help them increase church attendance. An estimated 40,000 ministers joined. There, I, I might add here, I didn't say it in that. Like they, ministers did not have to pay an initiation fee or dues. Uh, their congregations served as clan sanctuaries and recruiting camps. Ministers frequently outed themselves, so to speak, as clansmen during the services. Of the clan's 39 Cloakards, they had a whole rigmarole of these titles, uh, uh, traveling lecturers. 26 were ministers. Uh, the Southern California clan um, uh, was organized by Reverend Leon Myers. He arrived there in 1922 to take over the largest church in town and organized a men's Bible class, which became 
the Clavern, which was the clan name for a chapter, the chapter of Anaheim. The clan touted Anaheim as a model clan city so much that people began to call it Clanaheim. The home of Disneyland for you East Coasters. Ministers who risked deposing the Klan could become vulnerable to retaliation. Klan of officials sometimes asked friendly police to, quote, investigate allegations. And these are uh, quotes from some Klan correspondents. Uh, uh, you should investigate Reverend X's sister because she married a reformed Jew who was associated in work at a Negro school. Or that another ex was head of a, quote, interracial committee, which is a branch of Negro Association in New York. Right. I think this is histori historiographically very interesting and also has uh, contemporary resonances. I mean, we'll talk about those a little later. But I mean, I, I think a lot of liberals, uh, kind of cosmopolitan intellectuals, uh, secular folks, kind of are kind of baffled by the attraction of evangelicals and fundamentalist Christians for, for Donald Trump right now. But the more I study kind of the history of fundamentalist Christianity and evan evangelism in America, um, you know, we just kind of assume, well, Christians, they follow the teachings of Christ. What would they have to do with this jingoistic, kind of violent, uh, sort of radically sectarian and tribalist movement? But uh, there's, 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 there's a lot of that you know, within the history of American fundamentalism. It's also kind of a history of kind of revanchist, kind of ethnic, um, um, almost imperialism in a lot of ways. I mean, that, that's a through line in American uh, Christian history. Yeah, I found in some ways that one of the smartest things the Klan did was basically to fuse uh, racial and ethnic bigotry with religious bigotry. Right. Uh, to some degree, I would argue that the enormous size of the Klan uh, was made possible because it was, in a sense, an evangelical revival. Right. Uh, now, I'm talking about white evangelicals, not, right. of course, black evangelicals. But also, there's a slight difference between the evangelicals and the fundamentalists, and the fundamentalists were a little more standoffish. Right. You know, but a fundamentalist is someone who believes in the literal word of Christ and so on. They had some reservations, and the Klan never made much headway in the Protestant churches that were called the mainline, more liberal churches like the Episcopalians, the Lutherans, Methodists. and so on. Um, the, the, all Klan meetings began with a prayer. Uh, there were a lot of uh, ministers who published uh, work uh, about the clan or about clannish thought uh, as a part of this re revival. But also, I think, uh, I can get into this later, but I think the evangelicals also um, tend to have uh, services in which people move mm. and shout and participate. Yes. I think there might have been a connection between that and what went on in the yeah. chapter meetings because yeah. these chapter meetings they were, were like fun. extraordinarily dramatized choreographed. You have these like yes. scripts that go on for pages and pages. It was like it almost like you have these you have a whole glossary of the crazy words that all start with K. You have these fun raiments, you know, you get to dress up you get to go to parties all the time. You know, you get to be part of this club. I mean, one of the successes of this social movement clearly is that it's a great thing to do in a small town on a Saturday night. Yes, and also they, the Klan managed to uh, benefit both from lack of secrecy, but also from secrecy. Mm, because the they, they were public as members, but the, the oath that you had to swear to become a Klan's person, that you were not gonna reveal any of this kind of arcane abracadabra stuff. This is a really terrifying oath about what would happen to you if you were caught revealing these secrets. And that, I think, added to the notion that it's a kind of, you had a kind of cachet yeah. to be a member yeah. of the Klan. And that, uh, you know, again, I can go into it this yeah. later, but that's just And that's the fraternal about lodges. The, the they love are. the Masons. And, you know, that was kind of part of the culture then, yeah. too, you know. Yeah. But also you have a chapter uh, called KKK Feminism. So why don't you uh, explain what you mean by that? 
Sure. Uh, actually, this is the chapter in which I think that I might get the most uh, criticism because I know many people, and some of them are my friends who believe that you can't call yourself a feminist if you're also a racist and uh, all the other bad things that the Klan was. But the fact is that there were people and groups within the women's Klan that actually advocated serious uh, women's rights reforms. They advocated for um, harsher punishments or really taking seriously uh, what was then called wife beating, which we call domestic violence. Um, to go along with that, they advocated equalizing the standards for getting a divorce, which were in just about every state, completely a double standard between men and women. I mean, the most obvious is that adultery on the part of a woman was grounds for divorce, not on the part of the men. They advocated for equal inheritance rights, which were not then mandated. So there, there's a number of these very, very concrete things. And I look at that and I say, well, you have to call that feminism. It's just that not all feminism is wonderful. Um, yeah. There's even uh, this remarkable story uh, 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 that happened in Oregon of these this women's clan group chose as their kind of mascot or symbol Joan of Arc. <laughs> now Joan of Arc is she a was Catholic, Catholic, right? Okay, but the fact that they are identifying with this woman who led an army, uh, who is obviously not you know not a homebody, that says something clearly about how they want to be perceived. Yeah, yeah. So I think of you as. Uh, um, a pioneering feminist scholar. I'm sure that you have uh, a very interesting career in activism too. Um, uh, that's just uh, a, a, a surmise on my part. Uh, did you ever imagine when you were, you know, um, writing about, you know, say your history of birth control or were involved in second wave feminism in the 60s and early 70s that you'd be writing a book about the 1920s Ku Klux Klan and what's more that it would seem to be of profound contemporary resonance? I mean, this was not how the sport story was supposed to end, right? Absolutely not. Um, and um, in some ways, I feel like an imposter because I, unlike... We Greg, all do. I am not an expert on the right. I have never previously written about anything to do with conservatism. Um, I am not any better informed than any other reader of the New York Times about um, contemporary clannish clannish stuff. This came to me really by an accident that I was writing, and I'm still writing, a larger book about social movements in the 20th century US. And uh, I had the Klan as a chapter, and I did that for two reasons. First of all, it was obviously the largest social movement in the 1920s, no question about it. But secondly, I didn't want people to think that all social movements are wonderful. So I, I had already drafted this chapter, and then my uh, editor, my agent, a bunch of friends said, well, you need to put this out. Yeah. Um, so, so I did. Well, what, we're all reading this book. I mean, the, 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 there are always, uh, there's just lots of resonances. You know, I, one of the things I wrote a you know, big New York Times magazine piece that came out a few months ago in which I was like, wow, I thought the story I thought I was telling about the history of the modern right in America basically starts with, you know, National Review and Barry Goldwater, but you really can't understand what, what Donald Trump shows us is that you can't really understand the right in America without going uh, back to some of these revanchist 1920s um, movements that actually Hitler found a lot of inspiration in. He, he, he considered Henry Ford a role model. He considered uh, Southern, uh, Southern uh, segregationism as kind of a model for what he wanted to accomplish uh, in Germany. And we have um, some very fascinating uh, resonances involving, um, you know, basically the performance of uh, Demagoguery. You, you, I think you've mentioned that um, was it uh, David Stevenson would, would, would swoop down from the sky in a, in a plane with uh, his name on the side, right? And then you have uh, the Imperial Wizard. Um, uh, he says, "I've got the biggest brains," right? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, how do you uh, approach the subject of um, how um, this 1920s history? 
much as we understand the 1950s and 60s history of, of um, you know, National Review and Barry Gover and Ronald Reagan as obviously informing Newt Gingrich and Paul Ryan, how do you see this history as informing our contemporary movement? Um, I think to answer that, I want to start by uh, sort of disaggregating something because there was a marked difference between the Klan's anti-Catholicism and its anti-Semitism. Catholics could convert. If they did that, they were fine. Jews, no. In fact, when you look closely at it, what you see is that anti-Semitism for them was closer to racism against people of color than it was to the anti-Catholicism. Now, it's also true that the anti-Catholicism disappeared, and it disappeared quickly, because, for example, many Klan's people in the 1930s, some of you have probably heard of this radio personality called Father Coughlin, who was an overt supporter of, of Hitler and the Third Reich. Well, he's a Catholic, and the Klansmen went eagerly into, into supporting him. So there's something kind of fungible here. Mm -hmm. Whereas I think the anti-Semitism, and I, I think that the more, because I see so much of it today, is, is somehow more, uh, more fundamental. Um, it's... Interesting that in the 1920s, one of the things that the Klan had against the Jews was something that actually came true. They claimed that, these, that the Jews were in cahoots with African Americans. Now, the reason they did that is because in their view, once they saw that there were actually a, a civil rights organizations developing, well, that had to have been outsiders who were organizing and putting the blacks up to that because on the one hand, blacks are really happy in, with where they are in, in Klan speak, and on the other hand, they're just not capable of this. But what's interesting about that is that in starting in the late 1950s, Jews were in fact disproportionately represented in the civil rights movement. Uh, obviously, I see that when, as a very uh, a very positive thing, something I'm proud of, yeah. but uh, it, it just says something about the way these things yes. uh, carry through. Yeah, and when you tie that to the association of Jews with uh, communism, you know, then you, then you have a direct thread between that and what the John Birch Society was saying about, uh, and, and also governors of, of southern states saying about, oh, the civil rights movement was literally cocked up in Moscow as a plan to subvert the United States, right? Yeah, although the thing about Jews and communism is double-sided because the accusations are completely contradictory. Right, on the one hand, bankers, they're communists. Right. On the other hand, they're these yeah. predatory capitalists. Well, Robert, Robert Welch had a way of explaining that, but we, oh, won't, get it? It. we won't get into oh. it. There was, well, actually, the Illuminati was behind it all. and they were the, That only came about in the 70s. We don't need to go into the weeds on that one. But I think it is important to, uh, if there's one thing I've kind of learned in, you know, uh, focusing on the left, I mean, the studying the right going on 20 years now, is that um, in American reactionary thought and practice that fears the other are, are, are profoundly fungible, right? The names change, but the structure is the same. Uh, the way that Henry Ford, oh, we, maybe we have a de debate coming on, the way that Henry Ford talked about the Jews was the way that McCarthyites talked about communists. You know, uh, the way uh, McCarthyites uh, talked about communists, um, it, when, uh, when um, in the South, when people started organizing against the Equal Rights Amendment, and you remember the Houston Women's Conference, I write about that a lot in my manuscript that I'm, that I'm working on now. It was a big national conference in 1977, which was, turned out to be it was kind of feminist inspired, but turned out to be an enormous organizing opportunity for the new right that led to Reagan and uh, a uh, journalist who covered the civil rights movement in Mississippi and wrote an article about the meeting, the state meeting, uh, in which the forces of the new right and the feminists clashed about which was the, who were going to be the delegates to go to this conference in Houston. He says, oh, these are the same people that I used to see it white citizens council's meetings. And she's so like, wow, now they call them liberals, they call them feminists, the bogeyman. And then the bogeyman uh, has become Arabs, they're infiltrating, uh, the, the Muslim Brotherhood is seen as infiltrating the Obama White House. 
uh, and sort of like the, 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 the devil in the shape of a woman. You know, it's, it's um, the story, the narrative structure is the same, the name they give it, and this longing to, you know, construct oneself and one's community and one's integrity as a subject against this thing that you exclude. I mean, it's, in a lot of ways, it's universal. But certainly within American history, it, 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 it um, takes on these different crusts. Well, I agree with part of that, but I'm also going to take issue with part of it. The part I agree with is, uh, comes out of what you just said. I, my sense of clans people's feelings was that they had a tremendous discomfort with any diversity. Mm -hmm. They wanted people to all be alike. And I, in the book, I actually call it a, lo a, lo a lusting for purity because there are a number of ways in which this claim about purity was expressed. And in that sense, it's true that this kind of uh, hostility uh, to different groups is fungible and can switch. But I do want to say that there's really something different about the racism against people of color hmm. and anti-Semitism because you know, even a communist could change and mm -hmm. give up his communism and become, you know, we, people do that all the time. Mm -hmm. uh, a Jew can never do that. Mm -hmm. uh, Hiram Evans, the Im major imperial wizard, said, and I think I have this almost exactly right, um, a Jew could never be a good American precisely because he is a good Jew. Mm -hmm. um, and in fact, I, I can't, I, just a little bit of levity here. This is, I just have, this is one story I, I really enjoy. You probably all know the story of Jonah and the whale. Uh, Jonah was swallowed, but he came out whole, right? Well, one of the clan ministers had a different, slightly different version of this. The reason Jonah came out whole is that Jews are indigestible. <laughs> and what they literally meant is that as a metaphor for the fact that Jews can never be assimilated into patriotic Americanism. And I, I see, that, see that as uh, more characteristic of the attitudes toward people of color, that there do is you, something Do you not think there. that um, within that particular uh, fraction of the Trump movement, that's not how um, Muslims are thought of? Oh, that's interesting. I haven't thought about that. It certainly Let's is. Chew on it. Yeah. It certainly is Let's uh, people chew on that. Uh, something I've noticed that we have a rise in anti-Semitism and an, of Islamophobia at the same time. But uh, I don't know. We we would have to yeah. look at that. What what would what would happen to the Islamophobe if a Muslim converts? Is that person then okay? I don't I know. Could get into the chapter and rest on that. Luckily, we'll be able to chew that one over on uh, over drinks, but you guys uh, get to chew things over with us, or Linda, I should say. Uh, it's time for uh, us to uh, distribute the microphone that Bo has uh, in his hot little hand there. So who wants to uh, begin the Inquisition? A quick note before we get to questions. Uh, first off, Keep in mind, the books are available for sale, and uh, we will be doing a book signing afterward. Secondly, we are doing audio capture. So when you are selected for a question, please wait for this microphone to get to you. I'm sure you can project very loudly, but we just want to make sure our equipment can pick up, okay? So we have the, the, the TV uh, feed also. So uh, Bo, will, I'll let Bo um, kind of handle who to call on. So yes, that's just yeah. something. What is that you were saying about violence and nonviolence? Well, everybody doesn't have to be violent if you live in a small community and everybody knows two of your cousins are crazy. Mm -hmm. They'll be afraid of you anyway. You don't have to be violent. The other thing, well, recently I'd like to hear your opinion. In the media, the general public, and a lot of the more severe race rises, East New York, <coughs> East St. Louis, I mean, other places, they downplayed the number of the African Americans killed because they said the African Americans got the message, but they could put on a good PR, oh, it wasn't that many. But on the other hand, they also downplayed the number of whites that were killed because they didn't want to give the impression that African Americans could fight back. 
Maybe that was more like a comment, which I appreciate, but maybe we could take a few questions. Sure. And, um, there's a hand way back there. Did World War II affect the KKK? Yes, definitely. Um, as, um, as the real story about what, about the genocide, uh, became clear to uh, the U.S. and perhaps just for some people even earlier because the Nazis were master eugenists uh, who were, as you probably know, they were killing off disabled people as a way of so purifying and advancing the race. So it, this got stigmatized. Right. And, you know, I, but I think, you know, there's a core of stuff that doesn't go away it just goes underground. Mm -hmm. And we've seen that throughout, that you have these periods of a burst of, you know, earlier it was called nativism, then it's called racism, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call it, and then it, it can subside. Um, and that relates to what I said before about, uh, about the participation of elites, political elites, intellectual elites, and so on, in uh, various levels of of this kind of racism, it's, it's the difference between the quiet and the loud. In fact, one writer made this nice phrase saying, what's quiet in the center is allowed at the margins. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think yeah. that's partly what I, what I meant. My I also meant the mingling of the fact that people were with other people for the first time. Right. Yes. I, I think, yes, the pluralism of World War II. My own... Um, uh, interpretation of this is yes, precisely with this fungibility that we all need a, a, an other. A, think of a, a shadowy string puller, right? Who we need to kind of uh, blame for all our um, all our problems. A lot of that uh, it became illegitimate to blame Jews for that because of just the sheer awfulness of the Holocaust, and it became communists. Uh, another thing is there was a lot of right wing vigilantism uh, that was actually quite ugly and violent. In this city, and also in Boston, uh, a, a lot of it was Catholic and inspired by Father Coughlin. It was uh, called, the, I think it was called the Christian Legion. I wrote about that in my New York Times Magazine article. There was all kinds of vigilante violence that was supported by, a lot of ways, the, the Catholic hierarchy. A lot of this history is, is, is being um, fleshed out uh, for, the, for the first time because uh, it hasn't really historians have actually kind of leaned on the idea that America was a, a liberal nation for a, a long time. But anyway, uh, another question. We got, a, um, like I say, uh, Bo's got the guy who's the master of the microphone there. Yeah, I, I wrote a fair bit about um, FDR's New Deal, and to get the New Deal done, he had to kind of uh, deal with the devil in the sense of the, the, the Southern Democrats. Uh, but I'm wondering whether the plan in any organized way also kind of led to some of those programs not being equally, you know, uh, shared? Yes, that's a complicated question. Uh, they were extremely hostile to Roosevelt, and they called him with a Jew, they used to call him like Rosenthal or Rosenberg. They would, wanted to claim he was really a Jew at heart. Rosenfeld, yeah. Um, but, you know, their... Um, ideology was not anti-statist. They were yeah. not against government programs uh, such as public health programs, such as public schools. I found a pamphlet before. for a national health care, a plan pamphlet yeah. once, uh, yeah. because you know, the idea is they believed in the germ theory of disease and that foreigners were dirty. We need to protect ourselves from them. Yeah, in fact, I, uh, Rick would know more about this, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. I tend to think of this sort of anti-state libertarianism as coming from a, a more elite uh, group than... In yeah, Canada. I mean, it's like, well, as historians love to say, it's complicated. But there was a group that did claim to be, during the 30s, kind of a, a clan enforcement arm. You mentioned a couple times in the book, and that's the Black Legion, yeah. which I became very fascinated of. I discovered it basically just reading old files in the New York Times on ProQuest, uh, Humphrey Bogart made a movie about them, 1937. Uh, the, the Black Legion sued. Uh, they also um, were a lot more violent than, than the Klan as Linda depicts it, and they were actually um, basically hunting down uh, union leaders and New Dealers, and they were very powerful in Detroit. 
the police chief in Pontiac, a very interesting group that you know, we need more research on, uh, that clearly uh, saw the New Deal as uh, this basilisk that was once again bringing the infection to white Christian America. There's a lot of hands over here. I don't know where. Uh, yeah. Uh, Do you want to? Uh, yeah, okay. you got it there. Uh, in the Klan's <clears throat> sales pitch, was there, were there elements of like, a promised land or a great destination, not beyond the hate and uh, exclusion? In the past, man. Was, was there a millenarian? Oh, uh, I, don't know. I don't know if you'd call it millenarian. Uh, but there... Their notion was a little close to that because their notion was that America is really special and that they are, in fact, that both America has its destiny, but they have been called up to see that America can fulfill that destiny. They position themselves often as the rescuers of of the downtrodden, but the downtrodden, you know, this is another thing that's common among conservatisms. Yeah. They took up the position that they are the victims, that, it, that it's the white Protestants who are the victims and it's these other people who are trying to take away from them. And for example, they even used the same thing we hear today about immigrants taking jobs in places where there were no immigrants. So, it, you know, again, it's but it, it's close to that. I don't think I'd call it yeah. literally. I mean, millenarian. I think that's where, where uh, I, I think the Klan kind of merges with um, uh, the international fascisms, which is that it sees its transcendence in a return to uh, this millenarian past in which everything was kind of Edenic before the yes, bad guys right. come, yeah, came and yeah. took over. Uh, first of all, thank, I want to thank Thank you. Thank you. Um, I, I have two questions that um, I, I think are connected questions in terms of the history of ideas. I come from an anthropology background. I've done an in anthropology. I'm wondering first if you would comment on the extent to which you may see a connection between the eugenicist ideas that the Klan and people like Henry Ford were promoting in the 1920s, and someone like Arthur Jensen, who in the late 60s or early 1970s, and this is appalling to me, was able to publish a work of crackpot pseudoscience in the Harvard Educational Review with the title of How Much Can We Boost IQ and Academic? Um, achievement. And secondly, the mainstream reception for Charles Murray's book, The Bell Curve, which in my opinion is also a work of vulgar, racist, crackpot pseudoscience, but it got on to the front covers of Time and Newsweek where they treated it as if it was like a legitimate debate. And also, in terms of the history of ideas, going back again, the extent to which Franz Boas and other anthropologists in the 20s and 30s were pushing back against this. And, you know, it's so frustrating to me that this is coming through again. Don't you respond to that? Um, yeah, I, I think that um, uh, it's like a bad penny. It keeps coming back. And um, I think that... Um, yeah, I mean, you make an eloquent statement. Uh, you know, um, we shall overcome. <laughs> I don't look at me. Look at the, the man with the microphone. <laughs> Hi, you have, you have said too uh, much of anything about plan and stop and the uh, campaigns of intimidation yeah, using so night driving what? and hoods and all that stuff against African American people. And uh, specifically, um, I'm, I'm aware that there was a big effort on the part, for example, of the NAACP in the teens and the 20s and into the 30s to get a federal law against lynching. And it never lynching. succeeded. 
and I'm wondering if the Klan um, opposed it and lobbied against it. Uh, Absolutely, yes. And Franklin Roosevelt would never throw his support behind an anti-lynching bill. Um, obviously, as someone said earlier, he believed that he absolutely needed the votes of those Southern Democrats. Uh, he, yeah. Plus, he also had the luxury of being able to use Eleanor Roosevelt to somehow appease uh, appease the people who were more uh, anti-racist. Right. And um, yes, the violence in the South, and I think this passage also gets at how um, imbricated, how kind of tiled, uh, how, how big a part of the structure of society the Klan could become. Uh, one of the interesting details, I think it was in Oklahoma, uh, they had a rule in the Klan that if you were called to a jury, you automatically... Uh, um, uh, they can't automatically cancel cancel your membership. So when they asked you during the jury selection whether you were a Klansman, you could say no. Uh, so it's important to be able to have Klansmen on juries. You write about how um, the anti-prohibition governor, we can talk about the role of prohibition and all this, uh, of Louisiana discovered in 1922 that Klansmen were not only intercepting his mail and monitoring his phone calls, but it killed two of his allies. Examination of the corpses showed they had been tortured, but Klan supporting juries refused to convict the accused. Uh, Hoover sent FBI agents to investigate. Uh, with a chutzpah that reflected their naivete, Klansmen warned that they would take care of the federal agents. Um, pressed by the governor, Hoover charged 18 Klan operatives uh, with conspiracy, but, and this is, of course, a very, very, very familiar story in Southern history. Once again, the jury refused to convict. Yeah, and it just reminds me that I want to make clear that during this period in the South, the Klan was continuing its absolutely direct violence, and the lynchings continued apace. So when I say it was relatively nonviolent, I'm talking only about the North. I'm glad you asked that. First of all, fraternal organizations and some sororal organizations were widespread and had large, large memberships. This was still a continuation of this 19th century uh, pattern. Um, furthermore, uh, the Klan did some of the same things that other fraternals did and also that uh, political parties did, which is they organized all kinds of leisure activity for their members. You could spend your life in a clan community. There were clubs, there were uh, baseball teams. It was a Memorial that, Day parade, I think, where they had that altercation with the police, so they had yeah, parades. I mean, it just, just constant. Um, what, but the other part of this, um, and you know, I'm not trying to let Trump's father off the hook in any way, but a very good sociologist uh, that I highly recommend if anybody wants to dig deeper into this, her name is Kathleen Blee, B-L-E-E. -E. She did some work a number of decades ago in which there were people still alive from the 20s Klan who she could interview. Many, many of these people told her, oh, it was just another club. It was just another fraternal thing. Now, I grant you a lot of that is uh, 
kind of self-excusing oneself uh, decades later. But I have to believe that there was some of that. And I think the really crucial thing to remember is it was t at that time, it was respectable to be a member of the Klan. And there would be very few locations in which mere membership in the Klan would make you ostracized in any way. Why don't you name the roll call of some of the famous members of the Klan in the 1920s, some of which surprised me? Well, Hugo Black, the uh, Supreme Court Justice, Harry Truman was a member of the Klan, Harding was a member of the Klan. Most of these people resigned when they went into national politics uh, or you know, as Black did into uh, kind of national legal It was community. a big issue in his confirmation. It yeah. wasn't like, everyone was like, oh, forget about it, he was in the Klan. It was, people almost, it's very interesting. I mean, one of the st part, stories in this book and of the historiography of the Klan is that it faded pretty quickly. And you have, you know, your interpretation of why that happened, but I think also it's quite possible that some people, you know, kind of memory hold it within their own kind of, Narratives. Yeah. You know, it was kind of a shameful. Now, of course, in the case of Fred Trump, we don't need to verify whether he was actually an active Klansman or what kind of Klansman to know he was a racist. We know that he put little C's next to all the quote unquote colored applicants to these buildings, and the Justice Department nailed the case to rights, and so they settled, right? Um, but I looked through, um, I think it was uh, BuzzFeed had a kind of like a very thorough examination of every scrap of paper they could find on that, and mm -hmm. it was a Klan parade. There were lots of people arrested. They got in an altercation with the police, and that everyone who was arrested was wearing a Klan robe. So unless the Brooklyn Eagle um, is not a particularly reliable, had, did not have particularly reliable reporters, then I would say that there's a pretty good chance that we can establish not to a legal certainty, but we pretty confidently that, yes, mm. Fred Trump was a member of the Ku Klux Klan and was arrested uh, during an altercation with the police during a parade in Queens. Hi. Um, I was thinking about uh, Birth of the Nation, which I believe is from 1915, and was based on the public plan. And I'm just curious uh, what those two words, uh, what effect they had in uh, legitimizing the second coming of the Klan, um, and also uh, embedding the 19th century Klan uh, in as sort of a part of the foundational myth of the United States. I think I missed the very first part of what you said. You were asking if if what group had an impact? Birth of a Nation. Um, if the film. Oh, birth. Film, birth of a Nation. Oh, Birth of a Nation. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah of course. No, it was a major clan. Uh, the clan used it constantly. Now it was it it appeared in 1915 before this happened, but they organized showings uh, in all kinds of cities, uh, and actually made a lot of money. Uh, from using that film. Yeah, and it was shown for a long time. Uh, Reagan was born in 1911, and he always said, my family wasn't racist, and we don't have any reason to disbelieve him. And he said, my father wouldn't let me see Birth of a Nation. I really wanted to see Birth of a Nation as a kid. Now, one reason his father would have hated the Klan, which he did, was because his father was a Catholic, right? It wasn't merely because, you know, the Klan was, was racist. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But it was a very big part for a long time of American public culture. I think this will be our last question. Whoa, okay, I got a last question. <laughs> I, I'm um, very appreciative of your lighter side and your humor. I wanted to tell you quickly just something that happened here at the Court Street Cinema. It was a Tyler Perry movie. It's the only one I remember. We were, um, and I do think it depends on the color of your skin, whether you were still really afraid of the Klan or not. But we were some of the very few white people that were in that particular audience, and that it was filmed. And Tyler went to the South for some reason as Medea, that character that he yeah. becomes. 
And a guy was uh, was doing a, um, he had a knife, and he was cutting something. I guess you call it whittling or whatever. And he and Tyler got out of the car and asked the guy where he could go to the bathroom, or she could go to the bathroom, because it was a video. And the guy said, oh, really, over there. He went in over there, and he saw that it was a, it was a group of clan members. They all were wearing white. And the audience went crazy, crazy. And, and Medea or Tyler Perry ran out and was so afraid that they, he dove into the car. He's a heavier woman in this particular film. And he dove into the car in the back seat, and they, they pulled away. I think there, it reflected a lot of fear. Now, we all laughed, all of us. Everybody was laughing, and really, but there was a great deal of fear. That is not my question, however. I just talk. But my question is actually on the women. I'm really interested in your feminist KKK group, and they remind me of the women who supported Trump when he was uh, elected. And I don't know if I understand that well enough. I'm curious what you think. Well, uh, I'm sure I'm not alone in saying that it was very uh, difficult for me to understand how many. Uh, white, white women uh, voted for Trump. Um, one thing is clear, and that is just because people are women does not mean that issues about uh, oh, gender equality are going to be their highest priority, right? Um, but I also think, and you know, uh, this is now just me talking just as an ordinary citizen, not as a historian, but that a lot of that vote was really more an expression of tremendous anger than it was any carefully thought out, consistent, ideological position. And uh, I was recently in a conversation uh, with someone who uh, did know quite a bit about the alt-right and a lot of the mainly particularly young people who are in these white nationalist groups. And you know, the, today the Klan is only one small part of the white nationalist movement. But anyway, this, this person who uh, interviewed a lot of people said, well, you know, that a lot of them are just very confused. And they don't come up with a com completely clear uh, ideological position on a number of things. Um, and, and this goes back to though what reason I, I like very much this concept that came from Raymond Williams, which is a structure of feeling that they are part of a community of people who have built up a feeling. But you might know more about this than I do. Well, I think that um, if you were to kind of uh, frame the structure of feeling that uh, might, uh, and of course there's lots of different kinds of Trump voters, uh, impel a woman to support him, uh, one of it might be uh, that um, the idea of restoring um, a uh, stable, hierarchical, trustworthy, knowable uh, moral order. Uh, and that's um, uh, in which, you know, the nuclear family at its center, the, the basic, you know, conservative principles. Uh, if you see conservatism as I do as fundamentally about uh, a movement uh, of establishing hierarchy and order against sort of the, um, the liberatory energies of various kinds of subaltern classes, uh, then, um, you know, it can be very comforting to have a strong man promising to protect you, right? I mean, that's uh, one story that you can tell about the world in which Trump fits in that role. And, you know, you can laugh, but as scholars and as analysts and as journalists and as whatever, as writers, you know, you have to take the evidence as it comes. You know, that's where the theory comes from. You don't start with the theory and then work back to the facts. So, you know, I thought this, think this is all a challenge. Uh, I think that history helps. Uh, I think that journalism helps. Uh, but this is a movement, uh, as was the 1920s, of um, profound uh, change and confusion. And uh, that's when a uh, reaction thrives and it doesn't go away. I think a lot of us from, you know, remember in 2008 when Obama was elected that maybe we thought all that bad stuff was behind us. I, I just, the, my most recent article, yes, 
some white folks thought maybe that bad stuff was behind us. Thank you. Uh, and uh, the, la the most recent article uh, I ha I've published in the Washington Spectator is about how the week before Donald Trump gave that speech in which he descended on the escalator and talked about how Mexico was sending us all as rapists, a lot of people were celebrating the fact that South Carolina uh, voted to remove the Confederate flag from uh, the, the, the state house grounds. And people were passing around a viral video of a Republican state senator saying, I am a descendant of Jefferson Davis and we have to turn our backs on this. And Americans, I think, long, because there's so much wound at the heart of our national story, long for that kind of transcendence and consensus and healing and we keep on seeing it and seeing it and seeing it. But uh, I think that, um, I think as long as we're America, we're gonna be struggling, maybe you agree, with that dialectic between progress and reaction. Yeah, uh, let me just close by saying two things uh, around this that um, come a little bit from this history, but a lot from just observing the present. One is that uh, one of the things that characterizes this kind of movement, which we are now seeing all over the world, is uh, that people have perhaps genuine grievances, but they always blame uh, the disadvantaged rather than the advantaged. And that is fundamental to what makes these movements right wing, that they don't go after the people who are really, uh, you know, and have the e economic and political power. Um, but the... Um, the other thing I want to say that I think we can't forget, and it, it's a little bit true of the Klan, uh, but it's a lot true of Trump, and that is that beneath all this uh, angry rhetoric and racist uh, rhetoric and, and all this stuff, there is another agenda, and the agenda is, uh, you might just call it neoliberal, because what's going on in a certain sense underneath the Trumpian rhetoric is uh, you know, the deregulation of everything that provides us with, as citizens with any safety, the deregulation of, of, of climate issues, the deregulation of safety issues, the deregulation of consumer protection, the deregulation of Wall Street. So, um, and my sense is that some of the Klan supporters were people who uh, benefited in that economic sense from this kind of right-wing stuff. But it's really visible today, I think, and it, it, in my view, it's the only possible explanation of why so few of elected representatives of this party have been willing to really uh, step away from his agenda. The struggle continues. Uh, please join me in uh, thanking Linda Gordon for her gift to us. Thank you.